Health Matters is proudly supported by MultiCare. Depression, anxiety, trauma, all growing issues for people across the nation. Finding care for mental health issues like these is a challenge. And we'll talk about how we can meet it next on Health Matters. Good evening, I'm Aaron Luna. Welcome to Health Matters. In Washington, 32% of adults have reported feeling depression and anxiety in the last year. Our agencies are, are really full, you know. There's more need than there are providers. And the need for mental health professionals is growing. Washington has been named a health professional shortage area by KFF, an independent organization that tracks health issues in the United States. But I think what I'm really noticing the last couple of years, especially since the pandemic, that regardless of the diagnosis, the level of anxiety has, um, is higher than we were experiencing prior, and it's moved to more kind of an existential piece for them. With us tonight, local mental health experts covering private practice, clinical care, and Spokane Public Schools. Dr. Billy Tyler, private practice therapist and president-elect for the Washington Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Sean Wright, clinical program director for Lutheran Community Services. Dr. David Crum, director of student services for Spokane Public Schools. We start with Dr. Tyler, and when we talk about mental health, how would we define what mental health is? What are some of the baselines that we can look at to determine someone else's sense of being? Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways depending on the lens you're looking through. For me as a systemic therapist, I'm really looking at mental health through the lens of the impacts it's having on the individual, but also the impacts it's having on the way that it's impacting the systems around the individual. So the impacts that their mental health is impacting the systems around them, including like the interactions they're having with their communities, their families, the relationships they're forming, and vice versa, how those um, relationships maybe with friends and family are impacting how they're feeling on the inside. So those uh, depression, anxiety symptoms are impacting them and those things interact and play off together and that impacts their mental health um, greatly. So it's kind of an overall encompassing, there's not one sort of factor exactly. that plays it into that. it all works that. together. And how, when you see, you know, what do you see happening in, in your practice, obviously? Are people able to get care when they need it or are they hitting barriers trying to get that help? Yeah, definitely in the last few years, I've definitely noticed there's a, a greater increase, especially from the lens of a private practitioner of a lot more calls coming in and a lot more, um, even, I have a pretty long wait list and I'm hearing from many that they're running into that in everywhere they're calling is that there's just longer wait lists right now. So there's a lot of barriers that people are facing and just getting an appointment, getting that call. So I do think it's getting harder and I think the need's getting greater. Is Are one of the barriers is just the increased need? Is there anything else that you're seeing as far as people being able to access that care? Um, I, I think the world, right? There's a lot of stressors happening um, right now in just communities in general. Um, and again, thinking that systemic lens, there's just a lot of stresses um, financially on a lot of people. The pandemic, I think we're still like, are, is playing a role on so many families right now in the reverberations that are playing out for them and like on relationships i do a lot of couples therapy so i'm seeing you know couples still coming in and they're still trying to navigate through like the transitions of the financial impacts that played out from the pandemic and inflation and social justice and all those things are coming out and playing out in homes and um, so i think that's also playing on why there's more need as well Sean, you work in a clinical setting. Does that differ from private practice as far as what you see the need being in the barriers? Yeah, so in community mental health, we see the, the need for a, a lot of people. Um, and we, we think about the whole system. So we're trying to serve mainly the Medicaid population, mm -hmm. um, also maybe a little bit of private practice and other things. And so um, the biggest thing we see is um, just just capacity, enough enough workforce, uh, enough therapist, enough time. 
Um, we're fortunate enough to have rarely closed our doors for new uh, clients, always serving sexual assault survivors. Um, but we are hearing that people are struggling to get uh, appointments when they need it. Um, sometimes people are not getting called back. So mm. we really encourage people to call. I know many agencies like ours are committed to calling people back. And even if we're not the ultimate place that uh, is the best fit, um, we want to talk to people and steer them where they want to go. But part of the challenge is um, there's a lot of different things in the community, and it's hard to know exactly where uh, where to go, what's open to keep mm. to keep tabs with that, and uh, to make sure that, that we really have good information for people. And I think we've heard from a lot of folks that they feel a little bit um, of a despair that mm. when they don't get called back, um, when they when they're waiting, um, when they, when they have to you know be delayed to to get going, it, it really makes them um, maybe even drop out of services. So there's a barrier of education, so to speak, as far as people not understanding where the resources are or not being made aware of where those resources are. And Dr. Tyler was talking about some of the driving factors for this, the pandemic, social stresses, uh, financial stresses. Are, do you see the same thing on your end? Yeah, absolutely. In community mental health, um, we have a lot of folks that are impacted by those social determinants of health. All of those factors, I would say, are, are amplified. Um, I think the other piece, too, is we have what well, looks like an increased kind of acuity of, in youth mental health. We have a lot of youth that are struggling. There's also kind of a, a paradoxical thing. I think we're seeing some destigmatization. I think we, have, we see a lot of youth that are open and willing to talk about mental health and to raise their hand and ask for help, which is amazing. And we have the challenge then of making sure that we have a spot for them. So it's kind of a balancing act of you're encouraging people to seek out these resources. At the same time, you have to make sure that those resources are fully staffed. Yeah, and I, and I would acknowledge that, like, I think it's hard even for us as providers to know all the routes and all the new sort of programs mm -hmm. and how to navigate that. And I, and I can imagine anybody seeking services, you know, is going to struggle with that. And so really would encourage them to, you know, talk to, talk to anyone that will talk back to them, right? Like, I think many people are trying to solve this issue and are trying to uh, direct them. So. Uh, I would say uh, I understand the, the frustration that folks have, and we're working hard on the inside to uh, make sure that those pipelines do exist. So it sounds like there's a deficit of providers. What are the factors contributing to that deficit? Is it just that now there's more need and the pipeline for providers has not caught up? Well, we know, we know some people are leaving the profession. Um, some, some clinicians are burned out. There's also barriers to getting into the profession. So to become like a master's level clinician, you have to go to grad school, you have to pay for that. Um, you know, reimbursement rates uh, are not always very high. So uh, the prospect of work afterwards is not always that uh, lucrative. Mm -hmm. So people struggle with that. Also, there are some challenges where we have really wonderful people who have the skills to do good clinical work but they may not be in a spot financially or otherwise to sort of pursue graduate level opportunities. So one of the things that the state and many people are looking at is using other kinds of providers or allowing people to do some work without necessarily having to go to like the master's or PhD level. And those things are, are moving, but they haven't really paid off yet. And I think one thing that, to think about is a lot of what we see now is a reflection of basically where things were, you know, three, four, five years ago. So you make the initiatives and they will pay off, but I don't know that they've fully paid off yet. Got you. Dr. Tyler, you're, you're versed on this as far as the legislature trying to move forward, breaking down some of those barriers as far as the education level that you need to be a certified clinician or licensed therapist. Yeah, the work I've done with WAM to the Washington Association for Marriage and Family Therapy has worked um, on many bills over the last eight to 10 years, trying to increase that access for um, and decrease barriers for clinicians beyond just marriage and family therapists. Um, two bills in particular, are, um, 1724 and 2274 in particular, both tried to address just what you're talking about there, trying to um, minimize the barriers for license, licensing and um, broader access for supervision. Um, and so those are both bills. Um, 1724 actually passed through both the House and the Senate last year, and 2274 just went through the House and is in Senate right now. So it's, to your point, it's, it's moving, it's slow, and even once they get passed, it's, then it goes and needs to go 
get um, to the DOH to get put into place the policies and procedures. So um, I think there is a lot of work to still be done. Um, and it's paying attention to, to, we need to increase that access, but also make sure that um, the general public also understand like what resources they actually need and that they're getting directed to the right kind of care for the needs that they um, have because making sure that they know who they're seeing and the credentials that they have and the training that the person that they're seeing and I think all of that is is a barrier in some ways of just the like trying to make sure that the general public educated to that because it can be really challenging to just hey I'm calling I need to get in to see someone mm -hmm. and you don't know what those letters on the back of someone's mm -hmm. name actually means and so I think um, that's something that's really important for us to address for people too is knowing you know if I need um, certain a certain level of care that mm -hmm they're going and seeing someone that has the right education level for that, or that if I don't need that and I need access quicker, that I can see someone with maybe that doesn't have the higher access of care uh, or level of education that I can maybe reach out to other resources. So I think that's something that is really important that gets looked into as well. Almost an entryway into Just the, the process and yeah. the system. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Real quick, I want to touch base. You know, Sean, you were talking about burnout as being a huge thing. Is kind of that the same? Are we in using the practice. same word in private practice and how prevalent is that? When we say burnout, what yeah. are we talking about? A small flame or are we talking about a large fire? No, I fire? think burnout is pretty big across. Um, I mean, I can speak for myself. Even there's these uh, ups and downs of burnout. Um, I think. I mean, being a mental health professional in general, it, it takes a lot out of you. You put a lot of yourself into doing good work. And if you are doing really good work, you are really, you really have to take good care of yourself. And to do that, it it's hard. You have to do a lot of continuing education. Mm -hmm. You're needing to like pay attention to your schedule, right? Which then means that you can't open up and see 40 clients a week. And think, so it's like finding this balance. And then if you, are trying to increase access and maybe open up your schedule in private practice in that way, then you're more likely to get burnt out fast. So it's like this tension you're always trying mm -hmm. to hold and um, be accessible and inclusive and bring everyone in, but also to be a really good clinician, you also don't wanna lose yourself in that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a dance you're kind of always trying to play. And then to your point with the financial burdens of reimbursement rates, and um, it's really hard to, I know a lot of clinicians would love to be on panels on more insurance mm -hmm. and be able to be accessible, but if you don't have the the ability to have the administrative staff to be able to support that, or you don't have a group practice, it starts becoming really difficult to even financially sustain that. You know, one of the things that I wanted to kind of bounce off this yeah. was, you know, burnout is kind of the umbrella term. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes what we see is we see compassion fatigue yeah. or we mm -hmm. see secondary trauma. And, you know, so when you look at that and it's, and it's a profession, you know, that, that's a beautiful profession of giving and working with others. And but that, that compassion fatigue does pay. And then when you're listening to and hearing and trying to deal with trauma, which the vast majority of the individuals that we have the privilege to see are dealing with trauma, it does come off on you. Another part that I, th I found really fascinating is n not much good came out of COVID, hmm. but one of the things that did was that it made the terms of mental health acceptable. Hmm. I can talk in a boardroom, I can talk in a classroom. And as that happens, you know, people, it becomes more acceptable to talk about that. We broaden that out. Uh, there's mental health, but then there's mental wellness and mental, you know, mm -hmm. you know, there's other terms, mental well-being, uh, you know, and people will s are accepting those terms and are willing to have that conversation. The Throughout history, you know, we've had shaman, we've had pastors, we've had neighbors over the fence, you know. <laughs> it, and people seek that out. But it seems to me over the last few years that the intensity 
<laughs> has increased in kind of what uh, we as a society are dealing with. And you work for Spokane Public Schools, which is a behavioral health agency. Yeah, we're one, uh, really one in the nation that is a licensed behavioral health agency. Nice. And so we have uh, 50 master's level clinicians that are out in the schools, and I agree with Sean. It's, uh, it has really reduced the stigma of um, reaching out and getting help. And we sat down with some of the therapists working directly to meet the mental health needs of students, and they say heightened anxiety is often taking a toll on success in school. Sometimes being a kid can be tough. Simple things like saying hello or finding a playmate during recess can be daunting. A lot of what I'm noticing with the students I serve is a great amount of uncertainty. Stephanie Silva is a mental health therapist for Spokane Public Schools in a program created nearly 20 years ago, specifically for students with mental health needs. And the need has only grown. Almost like an inability for them to invest in the school process. They're waiting for the shoe to drop somehow. And some of my students get concerned about threats in the school, high level of concern with safety. Spokane Public Schools is a licensed behavioral health agency with therapists throughout the district, with others working in Central Valley, West Valley, Cheney, and Mead schools. In cases where a student has lost the ability to cope in the classroom, they will be referred to the MAP school in North Spokane. It's always a privilege to have someone being willing to share with you things that are, are difficult for them, things that maybe they haven't shared with other people. Therapists like Michelle Owen work specifically at MAP, a therapeutic school where mental health care is part of the regular school day. Two therapists work with the 30 high school and middle school students in group sessions, as well as private therapy sessions throughout the week. It's a year-round program to keep its middle and high school students in touch with their services, something a lot of families couldn't find on their own. And for a lot of our families, they would like that for their child, but their life, their life does not allow space um, or time. Having mental health services directly in school helps families eliminate barriers and creates consistency that's vital for success. Without question, the barriers that it eliminates really helps our families, especially when they may not have access to services otherwise, be it transportation, be it not knowing what their Medicaid benefit is eligible for. Mallory Hinchy is a behavioral health supervisor for Spokane Public Schools. She says breaking down barriers is beneficial for both students and teachers. I think for the school staff, it's just somebody else to support them too, of understanding what they're dealing with in the classroom um, and helping giving them strategies right then and there. And she says the program's success isn't always measured with A, B, and C grades, but the small things for students, coming to school more frequently or saying hello to someone. But we also always hope we're just planting that seed that they will um, either have a good experience and will continue on with therapy maybe later on. With a growing need for mental health care, these providers hope the program will continue to grow and reach a point where there are multiple therapists in every school reaching any student that may need it. We love having the opportunity to serve in the schools. Um, and I think we're all very passionate about the work we do and we just, we wanna to continue to grow that. So Dr. Crump, what is on the horizon for that program? Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take and make services available to the students in their environment. They're going to work, which is their school. Mm -hmm. We're going into their, uh, their work and trying to make it more acceptable, more uh, accessible, and to be able to uh, decrease the time away and also to be able to help them be able to generalize right there in the moment of uh, the, the skills you can learn, the uh, self-regulation, the coping, whatever it might be, 
that they can implement it right there. Uh, we are always looking for grants. We look for um, partnerships. Uh, we just got a, a beautiful partnership with Novia or Launch Northwest, and we're an, we are funded by Medicaid. And Launch Northwest uh, gave us uh, two hundred thousand dollars to try to say, "Hey, let's meet the students that are not Medicaid, and we can." Uh, that are either underinsured or have nothing, and we can meet with them, and at maybe at that time we can then help them qualify more for Medicaid. So trying to broaden the scope of the who we can see, um, we're working with uh, SAMHSA grant, uh, which is a federal grant, to try to do universal screening, uh, which is not only just mental health, but it's uh, food scarcity, it's uh, eating habits, it's sleep patterns. Mm -hmm trying to do that mental well-being, mental wellness approach um, in Cheney and in West Valley and looking at trying to take that. Uh, we know that our students are struggling and we know that that's a good indication that the families are struggling and trying to get that service and the allied services because when, you know, one element is deficit, there's probably others that can be supported. And you are, in a sense, creating a model for other s districts across the country because there's not a lot of school districts that are doing that, is my understanding. Correct. You're sort of unique in that aspect. Yeah. We, when we became uh, licensed about 20 years ago, we were the only one in the nation that we could find. Uh, a nice thing is recently the state of Washington has really stepped up and several of the education service districts, or ESDs as they're called, in the state of Washington have become also licensed in the last two years. The state of Washington is really trying to find ways to reach out and to take services. And we have you know, a beautiful state, but it uh, goes from real urban to very rural. And how do we get providers uh, to be able to reach that? Um, you know, and so that's, the model is, it, it's a beautiful model and it helps families and and I have to say, I, I've really learned to broaden out the definition of family. You know, what the student sees as their family is their support system, and systems are critical to kids and to helping them. Great. Spokane Public Schools not the only ones working to address the need in a creative way. Sean, Lutheran Community Services, working alongside the Vanessa Behan Crisis Nursery to bring services directly to parents. Yeah, Vanessa Behan is a wonderful community resource. One of the barriers that some families experience is access to childcare. So it's hard to bring your young kind of person to therapy and participate with them if you've got other children that you've got to take care of. Um, and so one way we've met this uh, need is co-locating a therapist at Vanessa Behan one day a week. Um, and that therapist is providing a, a specialized treatment called parent-child interaction therapy, uh, largely. Uh, and so families can go, they can get child care at Vanessa Behan, they can do therapy, they can get other supports, and it's a much more convenient way to um, meet the need for them. And they might not be able to participate in services otherwise. Um, similarly, another program we have is also a SAMHSA-funded program in partnership with WSU, uh, where we have a therapist who is serving uh, rural schools through telehealth. So the schools do a universal trauma intervention, uh, and then for the students with the highest need, um, where they don't have a mental health therapist in the, the local school. Uh, they're meeting with our therapist via telehealth and receiving high quality care. And just to clarify, Vanessa Behan is a crisis nursery for, for parents. Yeah, so they serve youth up to age uh, 12, and uh, but really I think they would say any parents that are uh, struggling or just need some extra support, I, I would start with, with them. They have so many resources. You brought up a good point when you mentioned uh, telehealth. Is there a difference when you're sitting directly in front of someone as opposed to seeing someone on the screen? Is, are there benefits? Are there drawbacks to that? And we can have this discussion with the whole panel as well. Yeah, I think in general, you know, the research suggests that uh, telehealth does just as well for, for people. That being said, that is usually when people are choosing to have telehealth. So during the pandemic, everyone was sort of forced into telehealth and that worked for some, didn't work for others. I think now we are in a place where we can really get the best benefit when when it makes sense, when the client likes it, when it feels like it's working therapeutically, telehealth is there. And if that's not feeling like a good fit, and for many of the like young people that we serve, 
that's going to be hard to keep their attention of a six-year-old on telehealth, we still have those in-person options available. I can tell you with what we found is aligns really well. When we were doing and offering telehealth to our students and families, the elementary age liked it mm. better than secondary age, and which was really interesting. And we got to a point of what we called screen fatigued. They got tired of doing a two-dimensional. Mm. <laughs> the adolescents really wanted to be and see, you know, in person, and that except for one thing, group. They were happy on group for doing telehealth. But individual, we found a much greater impact with that being able to be recognized and be able to be validated and to have that interaction face-to-face. Uh, -face. But in the times when families can't make it, uh, lack transportation or uh, you know, illness or whatever it might be, Telehealth is a great option, mm -hmm. but what we're finding is they would prefer in person. Yeah. So Dr. Tyler, it seems like it's kind of a balance of both. There's not a one versus the other, it's a combination. Definitely. Um, I to be completely honest, during COVID, I had to shift my entire private practice almost overnight to completely um, telehealth. And for someone who does almost 80% um, of my practice is couples therapy, I was terrified <laughs> of what that was going to transfer to. But surprisingly, there were some unexpected benefits. These are anecdotal, not necessarily research-based, sure, but sure. in my own experience with my private practice, there were some unexpected outcomes that I wasn't expecting, like couples doing it in their living room with me. Like some of their changes were trans, like translating even quicker because they were sitting in their own spaces, having these discussions and then getting off and like moving on with their life. So there wasn't this like, we only do this in the office with mm. Billy and mm. then having to go home and try and translate that. That was very surprising for me. It didn't mean that when we could open up the doors that they didn't prefer to come in and have that space just to themselves. But it was really surprising to me that there actually were some outcomes that were actually better. And even, um, the access for some families, it was a lot easier to not have to find the childcare, that they could have their kids playing in the background and we could have our sessions and that made it more accessible. And some people have chosen that they could actually, you know, take their lunch break in their office and shut the door and we can do telehealth. And so there, there were actually some positives that I was not expecting that have been nice to see. Great. Well, thank you so much. We want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. If you want to reference any of the portion of this show, you can find the full program on ksps.org. We will be back in April taking a look at fitness as we age. I'm Aaron Luna. Have a good night. Health Matters is proudly supported by MultiCare.